the dietary intervention is not going to be the only, <laughs> the only thing for these muscle myopathies. Yeah. Um, you know, but from other other people's work, especially Dr. Velman's, who we um, you know talk to and collaborate with when we think about how to set up our studies, it's multifactorial. It's everything from genetics to housing, time of year, and the nutrition plane the birds are on. So it's kind of this holistic approach, really. But if you can have another tool in your toolbox, I think some of these really interesting nutritional interventions could be really key players as we move forward. All right, welcome to another episode of the Poultry Nutrition Black Belt Podcast. I'm your host today, Kelly Walmsley, and I'm joined by Dr. Liz Bobeck. Hey, Liz. Hi, I'm so happy to be here and chat with you today. Yeah, thanks for taking a break from your other duties, including poultry podcast host and then coming on to join me. <laughs> <laughs> so Liz, you are an associate professor at Iowa State, um, and you, how long have you been there? Um, 2016, I started January 1st, so time keeps flying. So eight year, just over eight years. Wow. Yeah. So yeah, time, it, for some reason it does keep going. Um, yeah, it's interesting. Um, so I kind of like to do a this or that kind of thing. And so I'm going to do a little rapid fire with you. So you bear with me. All right. Fried or grilled chicken? Grilled. <laughs> <laughs> Broilers or layers? Uh, I, I like the broilers. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. A little partial. Mountain or beach? Ooh, mountain. Um, and then fried or scrambled egg? Uh, scrambled. Love having some <laughs> scrambled eggs. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And now what poultry nutritionist or poultry professional would you take with a zomb in a zombie apocalypse and why? <laughs> that is... Okay. Well, um, my graduate school colleague, Vanessa Leone, okay. I would take in a heartbeat because uh, we got we got called um, sisters by our PI, Mark Cook, at the time, and we desperately wanted to go on, I can't forget, remember the name of the show, but it, it was the, um, you're, you get dropped here and you have to find your way to a destination. What was that show? Oh, I would love that. Yes. Yeah. I can't remember the name of the show, but early 2000s, I can't either, it was like, I know what you're yeah, talking about. Yeah. yeah. You're, you're lost and you have to, you get no money and you have to get, so we were, I mean, yes, zombie apocalypse, apocalypse me and Vanessa would, we would be I love there. it. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay. Well, we could talk for a really long time about one of those survival shows like that. Um, but let's just change gears, I guess, and talk about, um, we'll save that for another one or something, but, um, let's, um, talk a little bit about one of the projects that you've been working on in your lab, um, with, um, feeding and arginine silicate, uh, additive, and then it's, with broilers. And then you've also done some layer research, but let's talk about broilers first. Um, and so first, let's just talk about arginine, right? It's um, maybe not an amino acid that people would formulate to as much and balance for in the diet, but it's, it's one of those that's pretty important with immune function. That's probably what's most recognized for. Um, but so, you know, why are you focusing in on arginine and what, what's your interest there? Yeah, so um, we're, we're working with a company to do some of this work, but we were originally interested in it because it um, my, my group does a lot of immune work, and we're, of course, interested in uh, phenotype switching with immune cells and arginine use. Yeah. Um, but overall, as we keep reducing down the amount of protein in the diet, it starts to become one of those marginally or potentially limiting amino acids. So um, with more companies starting to actually supply those sorts of becoming marginal uh, limiting amino acids, um, different companies are supplying products that have different bioavailabilities. So um, this particular product um, is kind of in a pre-development stage. It's inositol stabilized. So it seems to be having some positive effects. Maybe it's available longer in the digestive tract and especially those broilers who are super digesters um, can, can pick it up along the digestive tract a little bit better than just um, you know, another uh, complex amino acid. Um, but it's just, it's so interesting because it, it could be one of those amino acids where maybe we should pay a little more attention to it. It could be limiting production. It could be limiting some immune function, um, especially in the higher producing broilers. So um, in, in that particular space, we're just interested in investigating um, effects on growth, especially with woody breast and white striping 
and some dietary interventions that can have impact downstream because one of its other effects is vasodilation. So um, it also can be improving blood supply to maybe a region in the woody breast that has been marginalized for blood supply. Yeah, that's interesting. So, um, and we're not talking about adding this great amount of arginine um, or the, the additive that you are looking at. How, what are the, what are the kind of incremental amounts that you're choosing? And then where, where did you go in with like, you know, are we at for an optimal dose yet? Or um, where are we at in the stages of recommendations? Yeah, so we identified this compound out of a group of several that we were looking at for changes to positive changes to performance and positive changes to incidence of woody breast, especially the severe woody breast in broilers, you know, at day 49. Um, we started at uh, an amount in the diet as low as 0.025% and worked our way up to 0.15%. So, you know, within, within that amount, we had four different uh, equally spaced diets. And it, it could be that maybe that 0.15, we even might need to go higher. Um, but we saw a lot of positive benefits in performance at the lowest dose at 0.025. And that was fed throughout a 42-day grow out too? Uh, 49. Yeah, we, we took some parameters at 42 as well, just because it's a common end date. <laughs> but um, yeah. we were looking to promote woody breast and we were we were looking at broilers, uh, male broilers that were more likely to develop woody breast over time. So what'd you find? So overall, we found that there might basically be a difference in uh, the amount that is needed for certain key end indicators. So um, overall, the lowest dose, the, the 0.025, was really instrumental in reducing the severity and the overall amount of woody breast by day 49. So um, where some of the other groups had, you know, 75% or more of the birds in this, the moderate and severe category, over half of the birds in the 0.025 were in normal. So, I mean, that's pretty phenomenal. Yeah, um, absolutely. So it, it, was, it was almost a 50% reduction in incidence overall. Um, but interestingly, the, they also had uh, improved performance um, at day 42. We didn't see it at, at day 49. It just kind of um, plateaued, if you will. Yeah. Um, but for white striping, some of the, the higher doses actually improved white striping much better than the low, the 0 0.025. So if your outcome is just woody breasts, maybe the lower, lower dose is better. But if you're looking into some of the other categories, white striping maybe, uh, you know, related to woody breasts that maybe a higher dose is better. But Probably the biggest issue with all of this is can the feed mill deliver it yeah. <laughs> at those low amounts? Yeah. Can it be put into a premix or something? So you might you might in the end pick a dose that works in the functional world and outside of research. Sure. Yeah. And so you're you're just looking at just this these small um uh, just supplementations, um, le uh, varying levels, and you were adding it on top of an already balanced diet, right? Um, yeah. yeah. And and so arginine was already. So what what I guess what were your amino acid levels that you were feeding um, from your goal for all of uh, compared to breeder recommendations? So um, we just followed the the published Ross 708, and I am fully aware that uh, a lot of groups will go above or beyond or below, and I know there are many amino acids that won't, but you got to use a published source, right, when you're working. Right, <laughs> you're absolutely. Working. Yeah. Yeah. So our target, I, our target, I believe, was 1.39 for arginine, okay. um, and we made space in the diet um, using non-nutritive components to make those other uh, the, the five diets total from control out to the highest amount. Sure. But, you know, overall, we're, we're trying to be as relevant to, to industry as possible, but also providing the simplest diet so we can test our ingredient and make sure it's not an interaction with sure. some other component. So, yeah, the industry nutritionist will say, well, this is actually what we feed. But I, yes, I, I, I'm fully aware that you have optimized amino acid doses beyond our research, but we, we are using some published values, which is kind of what we just have to work on because it's what we're, uh, we're able to repeat over time. <laughs> Sure. And you have to have some kind of starting point too, right? Um, and so, yeah, the, but I think this is really exciting um, data because, you know, you think about other breast, uh, you know, muscle myopathies coming along, you know, potentially, I mean, we got spaghetti breasts. Do you think that this might also be a solution for some of those other ones that are coming down or ones that we don't even know about? 
Yeah, it's it's such an interesting thing because if you if you sit on the potential mechanism that's a vasodilator, yeah. um, it it could help some of those other issues that are related to the muscle structure or function. Um, in our cohort of birds, we did look for spaghetti meat. We didn't see any, um, but it just could be our you know our group of birds um, because I know they kind of it kind of comes in in waves <laughs> in the industry. Yeah, I know. I've only seen it like once or twice in our plant and we process a lot of birds and that's what I, I don't see spaghetti breasts as much. But of course, um, you know, woody breasts and white striping see a little bit less of it than previously, but still see it for sure. So Kemen calls all poultry experts. You already know the key to a profitable operation is healthy, productive birds. Our team of poultry experts are driven by curiosity to develop science-backed ingredients and solutions that help you maintain feed and water quality, improve intestinal health, optimize nutrition, and eliminate pathogens. Learn more today by diving in at kemen.com forward slash poultry to learn more. Okay, well, what do you want to leave people with today? The dietary intervention is not going to be the only <laughs> the only thing for these muscle myopathies. Yeah. Um, you know, but from other other people's work, especially Dr. Vellman's, who we um, you know talk to and collaborate with when we think about how to set up our studies, it's multifactorial. It's everything from genetics to housing, time of year, and the nutrition plane the birds are on. So it's kind of this holistic approach, really. But if you can have another tool in your toolbox, I think some of these really interesting nutritional interventions could be really key players as we move forward. Yeah, I, I like that. That's a good one to lean on. Um, so uh, with closing, I've got one last this or that. Um, Chuck Norris or Jackie Chan? Ah, Chuck Norris. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, thank you, Liz. Uh, with that, we'll conclude today. And thank you all for joining us in another episode of the Poultry Nutrition Black Belt Podcast. Thanks, Liz. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs>